Good afternoon. This is Dyke Hendrickson, and I am the host of the podcast, Life Along the Merrimack. We talk about the health and the history of the Merrimack River. We also talk about things that go on in the community. And broadly speaking, today we're going to be talking about the mayor's state of the city message that she gave about a week ago. And we're also going to be talking about Plum Island. And we have some incredible aerial photos of Plum Island. And I want to share them with you. Um, one reason I'm talking about Plum Island a little more these days is because I'm writing a book titled Plum Island, A Vulnerable Gem. And there's some wonderful photos, aerial photos of Plum Island. Now, right now, the context of Plum Island is um, an area of near Reservation Terrace, a number of homeowners are concerned about erosion. But <clears throat> the photos that we're gonna see are gonna talk about Plum Island in general, its history, and how it interacts with the Merrimack River. So to start off with, um, I attended the State of the City message uh, recently. Mayor Donna Holliday uh, gave her presentation. This is the last one she will do on this topic because she <laughs> is not running for re-election. Jordan Reardon, who was on this show recently, uh, he was elected mayor. But I wanted to mention some things about Donna Holliday's tenure, which has been close to 12 years. And she has been a real friend of the Merrimack River. Um, she, uh, going back four or five years ago, she was urging communities upriver to stop or to do something about CSOs. So those are combined sewage overflows and sewage treatment plants in Haverhill, Lowell, and Lawrence, and Manchester tend to get to release sewage when there are heavy rains. And of course, in Newburyport, we're at the end of the line. So we see a lot of bad things down here. And I was talking to a fisherman this week. And he was saying, you know, fishing was very good in the Merrimack this summer unless there was a CSO. And that means millions of gallons of sewage comes down the river and collects here in the harbor and near the Plum Island. So there are real reasons to be concerned about CSOs. And Donna Holiday, Mayor Holiday, was a real innovator in this sense, and she has worked hard to limit CSOs by other communities. She also did a number of things, including during her tenure, the Bresnahan Elementary School was built. The Molin Middle School uh, had enormous renovations to it. The Senior Center um, on High Street was completed. Also, Joppa Park along the river was much improved. Um, the rail trail, which is also along the river, was created during this time. So there are a number of administrative things that the mayor did. I mentioned the ones that have to do with the river and she did a lot for the Merrimack River. Right now, as we speak, um, there are crews out at Reservation Terrace on the north end of Plum Island and they're putting in sacks and uh, different uh, elements to try to hold back erosion because there are several dozen houses, and this is 73rd Street, 75th, 77th in that area, that the erosion in recent years is remarkable. It's, they've lost several hundred feet of beach. And now when there are northeast winds, the water from the Merrimack River is being pushed from the river and into over the dunes and into the neighborhoods of you know, several dozen houses. So their houses are very much under duress. And that is one thing that Mayor Holiday is trying to solve right now. And that's a difficult thing. And so since we brought up the topic of Plum Island, let's look at some photos of Plum Island. And I'm aware that a lot of our um, folks are listening to the radio. Um, if not television. So I will try to do my best to explain what we're talking about. Here is a remarkable photo of Plum Island 
um, taken from an aircraft. Uh, the Coast Guard took some photos recently. A uh, Ron Barrett, who is a Plum Island resident, has taken photos. Steve Atherton, a Plum Island resident, has taken photos. And this shows the mouth of the Merrimack River. This is summer. Um, there are boats, there are wakes. The entire island can be seen, and it is remarkably beautiful. And you can see to the left of the screen, Reservation Terrace is in the very northern part of Plum Island. Um, part of that is owned by the city. There's a parking lot there. Um, there are restrooms there. And part of it um, is, is under state jurisdiction. But at any rate, this is Plum Island. There's a lot of marsh, as you can see. And we're very fortunate to have um, the Merrimack River coming right through. It reaches Plum Island. And there you can see there's an inlet there. So if you're on the bay side of the island, you don't get so much erosion. If you're on the ocean side, over the years, um, there has been um, houses have been fallen into the ocean and it has been difficult at different stages. Here is a rather remarkable photo. This is in March of 2013. And if you're listening, this is taken from an aircraft that shows the southern end of Plum Island. That's where the wildlife refuge is. And it also shows an enormous amount of waves and of surf. And so this is really um, a remarkable photo. You can see how much um, the Atlantic is pushing onto Plum Island. On the southern end, of course, is the wildlife refuge. And so nothing goes wrong there because there are no houses. On the northern end, that's where the community is. That's where the houses are. And so over the years, uh, numerous um, residential units have been under duress. In recent years, and this just came to my attention, actually parts of the southern end of Plum Island has been receiving more sand. Now in about 2013, there was a great concern on Plum Island because sand was disappearing, the surf was coming up to the houses, and in some cases, um, undermining the foundations. And this took place on Fordham Street, uh, on Annapolis Street. And so there were you know, real, um, the sand was disappearing and many of the houses uh, on the Newbury section especially were under duress. But also around 49th Street, um, that's just the Newbury, Newbury Port border, was also losing sand. Again, this is 2013. Then, uh, the, with federal money, the jetties were improved, and it meant that no longer was the sand disappearing, but it was aggregating. And so sand is aggregated since about 19, 2016 and 2017. <clears throat> so you have many beaches on Plum Island have more sand than they did 10 years ago. <clears throat> Excuse me, but it also means that those people on reservation terrace are losing sand. So there are winners and there are losers. This has been going on for centuries, but right now it's a difficult moment. Here is a, a map from John Smith. This is we're talking about the history now of Plum Island. And that's John Smith, an Englishman, 1626. And here was a map of Plum Island and Newburyport. You can see Cape Ann. You can see, then it goes all the way up to Cape Elizabeth in Maine. And there are numerous um, communities in, in the middle. But I plan to use this very old map in my next book. Here's another shot of Plum Island. This is not so, not so windy and so stormy. It again, you can see there's a taken from an aircraft. And this is a beautiful uh, spot. This is a sandy beach at the southern end of Plum Island. That's a state beach. And so, as we know, most of the southern part of Plum Island is federal. It's federal 
um, Parker River National Wildlife Refuge, which is, of course, federal. But the very tip of the island is uh, a state property. But there you can see uh, the southern tip, and parts of it look like they did centuries ago. When we're talking about the history of Plum Island, it was a wonderful place about a century ago, about 1890, 1900. Um, and many people from the town used to go, and they'd go to the beach. So if you're listening on the radio, this is a postcard from about 1890 or, not, or you know, just the turn of the century. And uh, here we see uh, women dressed up for the beach. They're in skirts. They're in hats. The men have ties on. And they're enjoying the beach. And one way things are a bit different is, say, in eight, 1887, um, there started to be a little taxi service out. Horse and buggies would pick people up, and they would trot out to Plum Island from downtown, spend the day, uh, perhaps dance at night, and come home. And so, uh, as you can see, Plum Island had a lot of fans. And um, I would, I'll go back to that for a moment. Um, and in about, say, turn of the century or so, in 1895 or, you know, 2005 or or 19, let's say, 1895, there became an electric trolley out to Plum Island. So people could get on the trolley. There were train tracks all the way out to Plum Island. People would come for the day. And so this is an example of uh, people enjoying Plum Island. And of course, they didn't even, in this photo, they don't even have bathing uniforms on, as they were called. They're all dressed up. But one of the things about Plum Island, which some don't appreciate, is how many wrecks there were of vessels uh, right off of Plum Island. And here's a photo from 1892, which a three-masted tall ship has uh, come asunder off of Plum Island. In the foreground, you see six or eight men in a in a uh, rowboat, large rowboat, probably 20 feet long. They're rowing out to see if they can help, see if they can save people. Newburyport was a tremendous builder of ships. Uh, they built scores of them each year. And Samuel Elliott Morrison, the great historian, once said there were, you know, Newburyport was the biggest shipbuilding center in the colonies in the um, 18th and 19th centuries. But they had many shipwrecks. And this is an example of a shipwreck right off of Plum Island in 1892. One of the ways that um, good citizens tried to help people involved in shipwrecks was to try to shoot a large hook out from the sand. The photo we're looking at now is called gun practice on Plum Island. And these guns would have a big hook in them. They would explode, the hook would go into the air and hopefully would land on the ship. If this happened, then either the ship could be pulled in or pulled a little closer, or if things got desperate, um, the crew members could uh, hold on to the rope that had come out and slide down and get to shore in that way. Sometimes it was too busy. And I mean, there's, the seas were too rough and a uh, small um, life-saving craft could not get out there. So this was called a Lyle gun. It was uh, in the eight, 1870s, 1880s, and this was shot out, so hopefully they could save some people. Um, and there were many people who put their interest into trying to help uh, people who were caught off of, in a rack or, you know, or marooned on a ship that was sinking. Here is a photo from about 1895. It's a life-saving crew on Plum Island. And you can see that five or six men are here. They are in uniform. They have a dory, a very sturdy dory. And it says, more or less, U.S. Life-Saving Service. Now, the Coast Guard started in Newburyport in 1790. And Life-Saving Service 
um, started several decades later, also on the North Shore. The word Coast Guard, the term Coast Guard, wasn't really minted until about 1915. That is when the revenue um, service that was, to, you know, the, what the Coast Guard was first called, merged with the Life Saving Service. That was in 1915. In 1939, these two organizations linked up with the Lighthouse Service. So you had co <laughs> Revenue Service, Revenue Cutter Service, you had the uh, Life Saving Service, and you had the Lighthouse Service. So in 1939, they became one, the Coast Guard. But here's an old photo from a Coast Guard station or the Life Saving Station, as it was known in about 1890. And here are the jetties in Plum Island. This is another postcard. If you're listening, what we're looking at is about 18. Uh, there was a big uh, break wall started in about 1873, right off of Plum Island. And it, it took 20, 25 years to build. But here you can see it in about 1890, 1895. Uh, fishermen would go off it. People would walk along the you know, you can see the large boulders there. It wasn't easy walking, but that was put in in an effort to um, help navigation. The About 1890 or 1900, as I say, this was a wonderful period for Plum Island. Here is, we're looking at a postcard of the old Plum Island Hotel, which was located where what we call the center is right now where the Beachcomber restaurant is right at the end of the bridge. And so this was a hotel that was built in about 1887. And it was very popular. Um, it was hard to get to Plum Island. Um, you know, there, you could take a horse and buggy. Some winters, the bridge washed out. But basically, Plum Island was beloved by duck hunters and fishermen. They'd come here, they'd shoot ducks, they'd you know, shoot deer and have huge meals at the Plum Island Hotel. Here's uh, another postcard. This is Oceanfront at Plum Island in Newburyport, about 1910, this is. And here, again, you know, this is before bathing suits came to be. And what we're looking at is several men with uh, bowler hats on and ties, and the women have. Uh, long dresses, they're sitting, enjoying a, a sunny day on Plum Island, and um, they have umbrellas. So um, I guess they weren't interested in suntans as much in those days or sunburn. Um, but also, for more than a century ago, there are quite a few cottages there in the background. Now, since 2006 on Plum Island, there have been many more large houses built, and I say 2006 because that's when um, the water system was put out to Plum Island from the downtown. Also, uh, the sewage system was connected up to Plum Island. But in those days, and again, 1895 or 1900, there were quite a few cottages and it looks like a good time. I had mentioned the trolley that used to exist, um, and here is a picture of it. We're looking at the northern end of Plum Island. There's a lighthouse in the background. And this is cottages and lighthouse on Plum Island. And it must have been a good life. The youngsters there to the left were watching the, you know, the trolley come along. And there's um, <clears throat> the, the trolley is picking up people, <clears throat> perhaps to take them back into Newburyport. And again, here's a trolley. Uh, there was a theater down in the center of what we know as the center today. And there, this is a picture for those in, you view on the radio about a, two, 1910. And this was a theater on Plum Island. The steamer Calarda um, is pictured here. This is Grape Island. This is an island um, right on Plum Island. Now there are no, fewer houses there today than there were, of course. But uh, this is a steam vessel uh, in about 1910. I would mention that Newburyport was a huge builder of tall ships, which means ships of sail. 
but it did not get into the steam age in a big way because those vessels um, had heavy engines, they were steel or iron, and they sunk. Uh, their draw was significant. And the Merrimack River, where it opens to the Atlantic Ocean, has always been very shallow, a 12 to 16 foot draw. And sometimes there'd be sandbars. So Newburyport did not get into building of these heavier vessels because the harbor was just too shallow. But here's a pretty shot of the Carlotta and it would bring people from Haverhill or Newburyport. They'd take the Carlotta down and they'd go around the bend of Plum Island and they'd probably go up towards Ipswich and, and take a sightseeing day. But this is a, a pretty vessel and it must have been a, a nice day on the water. This is the Plum Island Pavilion. Uh, this uh, existed. Um, you can see a lot of uh, people there. People would dance here in, from, say, 19, eight, 1887. Um, a pavilion was built, and there were different hotels out there. And it, the pavilion burnt down several times. And, say, 1915 is when uh, one of the big hotels burned down. Um, the pavilion burned down several times, but it still existed in the 30s and 40s. In fact, uh, my doubles partner in tennis, Dick Canepa, uh, his mother used to go out there in the 30s, and then Dick Canepa, who's now an octogenarian, he lives in Newburyport but, and is a longtime teacher at Pentucket. Uh, he would go roller skating there in the 50s. So it was a pavilion for dancing for a while. And then even in the 50s, um, there was roller skating there during the week and dancing several times a uh, Wednesday and Saturday. So you could have a good time on Plum Island. And I love these old postcards. This burnt down in the mid 30s. It was rebuilt, but then uh, it, it burnt again. And uh, there's no pavilion down there now. This is a wonderful aerial shot of Reservation Terrace on Plum Island. Uh, you can see, um, you know, there's a lot of land out there. There's a lot of doom. And of course, many houses have been built over the years. This is a marsh scene from Plum Island. Uh, this is a postcard. And in the 19th century, um, there was a, farmers would um, harvest the salt hay there. It could be used in the barns, it could be used for feed, uh, but it, they'd have to put it on these structures so that when high tide came in, their whole collection would not float away. This is from about 1910. We're looking at a man in a top hat, a tie, a vest. He's in a dory next to a very large uh, gathering of salt hay. But this is a wonderful photo. And of course, um, the marsh is still used and Farmers still cut, you know, salt, salt hay from there. In fact, I bought bales of hay um, on the way to Governor Dummer, or Governor's Academy. I don't want to date myself here. Several times um, for the winter, for the flowers, and so salt hay is still very much used. This is a photo we're looking at. Again, this was a postcard. Uh, you see the. Um, a, a lighthouse there, um, people would come down and one of the last, um, how, you know, there used to be small hotel, hotels down there. There was a lighthouse to help the ships get in and it was um, a wonderful spot to be. This of course is a modern photo. What we're looking at is a storm at Plum Island, the southern end of the island. This looks like it was down around Annapolis Way. And so in recent years, um, until the jetties were put in in about 2015, a lot of sand disappeared and people would put these large boulders in front of their houses. And this is what you can see here. You can see waves coming very close to houses. But by this photo, I think taken in 2018, many of the homeowners had put boulders in. Um, so it would hold back the sea to some degree and um, people would be able to keep their houses from um, floating into the ocean. 
and here is another photo that um, we're looking from a, an aircraft here. In the lower left, you can see the, the what's called the center. There's parking there. There's the old the snack bar right in the middle. There's this groin area that goes into the water. And so here you can see to the lower left that um, the boulders have been put in, uh, that many of the homeowners were realizing that if they didn't put boulders in, that um, the sea would come right up to where they were. And I mentioned this, I, I mentioned this earlier, but since the, uh, so the two jetties were completed in about 2000, 16, um, there has been an, an accretion. Uh, in fact, more sand has gathered on Plum Island. And so these rocks aren't as necessary as they were. But in 2013, after storms, they were quite necessary. Here's a pretty shot of Plum Island. Uh, this is a beach. This is near the center. There's some sandals there. It looks like someone took off their sandals and is walking along the beach. But this is a pretty shot from this past summer. This is um, the Annapolis Way area. And some people here have, have put these very large uh, rocks in. And old timers down there say if those boulders had not been put in, this is, you know, some of these large, beautiful houses would have gone into the sea. This is on the bay side. This is a photo we're looking at on the bay side, Harbor Street. Basin Street. It's on, you know, the western uh, edge of Plum Island. So in other words, you're not next to the ocean, but you're next to the inlet. And here's a, a nice moment, uh, a few boats there, and you can see it's a, a lot more tranquil. Again, this is the basin side, and it's just, you know, sitting on the porch or watching the sunset from there in Plum Island is a beautiful thing. This is an example of, um, this is near Reservation Terrace. We had talked about this. This is from 2000. Um, and people had, were, re were seeing a lot of high tides. And this is an example. They put some plastic bags there filled with sand and rock. But as you can see, this did not work. You know, it, well, it just didn't work. It, you know, the, the bags broke and these, you know, they, floated off into the ocean. It was a terrible thing. So people in that very northern part of Plum Island certainly are doing everything they can to keep the ocean away. And this is a shot uh, taken at low tide, but you can see this was taken just um, several weeks ago. I took this shot. But to the right, you see, you know, one home is very near the high tide mark, and there's some boulders there. And as we speak, <laughs> they're putting out um, not boulders, but they're putting out heavy sacks that they hope to hold the tide back with. So we'll see how it goes. But as I say, some of the area on Plum Island has more sand as a result of the jetties that came in. But the very point at Reservation Terrace um, is under duress. This is our last slide for the day. Um, it's a, you know, an aerial shot. It shows the southern end of Plum Island, the in inhabited part. And here you can see uh, the groin there to your left. You can see the boulders that have been put up and you can see that most homeowners have done a great deal to try to keep their home stable. And as I understand it from some of the people who live there, um, it has been working. So that's it for today. I am Dyke Hendrickson. This is the podcast, Life Along the Merrimack. This is Joppa Radio 96.3 and Channel 9 Local Cable. Thank you for being with us. We talk about the life and history of the Merrimack River. Sometimes we talk about Plum Island. And today we looked at some very dramatic photos of the island. Um, and we will continue to do that for the next few weeks. Thank you for being with us. And we will be with you again another time. Goodbye.